Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're letting folks trickle in and then we'll get started in a minute or two. Okay, why don't we get started? Does that sound good with everyone? All right. Uh, so welcome to another session of RevPsych 2020 Decolonizing Mental Health. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Srija. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a medical student at Yale and part of the RevPsych Organizing Committee. I am a South Asian woman with long black hair and a black floral top. Firstly, we have live closed captioning available. Thank you, Christy and Christine for your help transcribing. Instructions will be posted in the chat on accessing live captioning. To access the captioning, select show type subtitle on the closed caption or more menu. And if you'd rather see the full transcript, there's a link in the chat that you can use to see it in a separate browser. I wanna to start tonight's session by acknowledging that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pogasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is called the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. This acknowledgement is but one step recognition and we look forward to using this platform to further explore decolonization. The series aims to broadly explore what decolonizing mental health looks like. Last week, we discussed radical inclusion of mad and neurodivergent folks in activist spaces. We'll drop a link where you can find information on how to sign up for our remaining sessions. And videos and full transcripts for our last two sessions and keynote have been posted on our website website. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce AZA and Durbin, who will be presenting The Art of Decolonization, a musical exploration. AZA is a first generation American who grew up in Trinidad before living in a number of different states on the East Coast. He studied biology, philosophy, and jazz studies at North Carolina Central University before carrying out social neuroscience research training in the Thai lab at MIT as part of the Harvard Medical School MIT MD PhD program. He studies how social information is computed, integrated and biased in the brain and the resulting impact on cognition and behavior. He also studies the mechanisms by which music and mindfulness 
modulate social connectedness and stress management. His research is guided by the belief that deconstructing these mechanisms will provide a better understanding of how social groups function and offer critical insights into enhancing the development and function of society at large. AZA is a multi-instrumentalist who is deeply rooted in the experience of music from the African diaspora. He engaged in formal studies of gospel and jazz music in college and as a PhD student was awarded MIT's Emerson Scholarship to study at Berkeley College of Music and has released multiple projects of his original music. He teaches music and mindfulness as tools that help enhance empathy, social justice, health equity, and wellness. To that end, he co-founded Renaissance Entertainment LLC, a company that operates at the intersection of music, science, and community building to promote a culture of wellness. He does research and provides clinical care as a resident in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University. Durvin was born in Columbus, Georgia, to a family with strong Jamaican roots. The eldest of four siblings, he was deeply impacted by his rural upbringing and the friends whose diverse backgrounds enabled them to show him love in myriad of ways that influenced his trajectory and worldview. He attended the University of Georgia, where he earned his BSA in biological sciences. In 2014, he was the recipient of the University President's Fulfilling the Dream Award in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. awarded each year to the student who demonstrates excellence in leadership, academics, and social engagement. He then went on to earn his MD from Yale University where he was awarded the Leonard Tao Humanism Award. His research and clinical interests lie at the intersection of medicine, psychiatry, social cognition, and spirituality, for this is the pedagogy that he believes allow us to understand what it really means to be human. A little bit of housekeeping before we dive into the live performance. Uh, we will hear from uh, AZA and Durbin first, hear a live performance, um, and have time for Q&A at the end. As a heads up, uh, there will be some explicit language in the music featured. Uh, we have a feedback form that we will share in the chat. Um, please look out for it because we want to hear your input. Uh, and feel free to use the chat and the Q&A functions for uh, any questions or discussion. We do have some discussion ground rules. Uh, take space to share your thoughts, uh, but also try to make space for others. Use I statements to speak to your specific experiences rather than using generalizations and be thoughtful in your storytelling. Uh, avoid detailing specific instances of distress or violence that may be re-traumatizing. Uh, and with that, I'm very excited to hand it over uh, to AZA and Durbin. Thank you both so much. Round of applause. The new movement gives rise to a new rhythm of life and forgotten muscular tensions and develops the imagination. Every time the storyteller relates a fresh episode to his public, he presides over a real invocation. The existence of a new type of man is revealed to the public. French Fernand MD, the wretched of the earth. So good. 
Afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, website series. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope it's cool. I know there's been a lot of changes with COVID, so this is a strange time, but we're all making adjustments, and I think this is going to be really cool. Uh, it's going to be a really cool session tonight. Again, I'm Derby Cunningham. I'm one of the new psych interns here, uh, helping out uh, one of my colleagues, AZA, tonight. Uh, and I think we got something interesting for you guys. So the way that we're going to break everything down tonight uh, is in a couple of different parts. So the first part is going to be kind of an academic discussion led by AZA, or really an academic lecture. Um, and this kind of centers around music being the heart of decolonization as it relates to mental health and psychiatry. Uh, then we're going to segue into you know, what we call uh, the experiential part of it, the experience. And in this part, there's going to be some musical performances at that time. Uh, we really, really encourage you guys to use headphones to get the ultimate experience. And, you know, I, again, this is coming through Zoom, but I think it's going to be, still be a blast. We're going to follow that by an interlude. It should be about four to five minutes long. Uh, and then we're going to come back and have a discussion. So I'll help to facilitate that discussion. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I know that we have like a Q&A tonight. So we hope that this Q&A will kind of be embodied in this discussion. Um, so feel free to ask questions. I already have a couple questions prepared. But ask questions, I'll check the Q&A and um, ask them the AZA. We'll go from there. Um, so kind of in starting off first, I think it's very important with any discussion, any uh, talk, just really to define certain terms. And I think because a lot of this really uh, surrounds the idea of colonialism, coloniali colonialization, um, I think it's really important just to kind of really define that. Because I do think it means different things to different people. And I think it's a very, very weighty term. Uh, so kind of starting off with kind of what is colonialization? So colonialism is a practice of denomination, which involves the subjugation of one people to another. So the colonizer essentially he internalizes colonialism and its attendant ideologies. Uh, colonized people, uh, they in turn internalize the idea of their own inferiority and ultimately come to emulate their oppressors. Uh, racism here functions as a controlling mechanism which maintains colonial relations as natural occurrences. So in saying that, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and transition to HZA who will kind of go through and lead this kind of academic series. Yeah, thanks so much, Dervin, yeah. um, for, for setting us up with that. Um, I want to start a little bit by talking about my story um, in a little bit more detail, because I think it will help contextualize like why I'm even doing this and why I think it's an important discussion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my story really has three main threads. It's my love for science, my love for music, and my love for spirituality. And so like, at a very young age, you know, I was exposed to music and, again, grew up in this uh, uh, an immigrant household in which, like, you did things because they were necessary to survive. It wasn't really about how you felt, like you didn't really deal with how you felt. You dealt with like what needed to be done. But yet I still remember like there were times where my dad would come home after a rough day and he would just sit at the piano and like play for like an hour. And my mom would sit there and listen, we might be in the living room doing homework. And although nothing was being said, there was so much being communicated. And it was one of my er you know, early experiences of realizing this is a thing that allows people to maybe manifest and communicate certain things that they don't have an outlet for otherwise. Myself as a child, you know, started to realize there are only certain things I felt when I was engaging with music. Um, again, this love for spirituality showed up because I grew up in the church. My dad was a minister. Um, and it became very clear in the Black church that, like, there was something about music that could move people in these really powerful ways and, like, give them this outlet that it seemed like they didn't have anywhere else in society. So my love for music grew and I kept doing that. But like I said, I also love science. And so... Um, you know, decided to pursue an academic path because I found a lot of value in this idea that like you could be a scientist, you could be a doctor and like use that to help people. But music was always something that was intrinsic and I continued to do it, you know, throughout, um, you know, my, my med school, grad school. But every time I would tell people I did music, they always took it as kind of like, oh, that's cute. Like you do music, it's nice to have a hobby. But I was like, no, like I really, no, I'm really passionate about music. I want to do it seriously. Um, but the higher that I went, it always felt like you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. Um, but I kept playing it, you know, because I loved it, but I really didn't see a way for it to really fit into academia. And the more and more I started to pursue music and like know that this was something I really had to do, the more and more I felt like there was a huge part of my identity that I couldn't bring into the space. Um, and so this kind of all led to a head, um, like my third year of med school, I remember it was one of those days where like another black person had just been shot and it was like all over the TV. And I was like walking into the hospital and I was just like, yo, I can't do this. Like, I can't go in here today. Like, I, I can't deal with the bullshit today, you know? And so I called one of my friends and I started breaking down and just like crying and being like, yo, I, 
in here, like I'm wasting my time. These people don't care about what's happening in society. Like just this whole rant, he kind of talked me off the ledge and be like, dude, you know, like stay focused, blah, blah. I went in, you know, a couple of hours late to my surgery rotation. And the first thing the surgeon asked was like, hey, how are you doing? Like, you know, how are you? And it was the first time I was like, yeah, actually like, I'm not okay. Like, do you see what's happening in society? And it actually led to a really honest conversation. And, and like, we, we made a genuine connection. So I started to think and, and realize that like over this process of like conditioning through academia, I'd actually become colonized myself, right? So this becomes a story about personal colonization. I realized that somehow over time, I'd actually start to bind to this notion that like me being my full self within a certain space was actually not optimal. And that like, if I did do that, somehow it would make me less of a scientist and less of a doctor. And I started to actually believe that. And so that process of like recognizing that and then deciding to actually decolonize myself and become free, you know, music was at the core of that. And so my first project was choices. And it really represented the choice for me to say like, no, I'm AZA, I'm an artist, I'm actually serious about it. And I'm also gonna be a good scientist and I'm also gonna be a good doctor. And like, that's okay. And it's okay for someone to have that identity and really embracing that within the academic context. Uh, my next project, Unlikely Stories, talked about survivor's guilt and dealing with like being from where I'm from and like seeing the kinds of things that my family got through and then arriving at this place of relative privilege and how kind of dealing with that kind of strengthened my desire to really pursue freedom and self-realization. And then my last project, Black Pack, kind of contextualized that story and the larger story of, you know, the struggle for freedom of, you know, people of African descent. And so I try to tell you a little bit of that story because to me, this idea of colonization and decolonization and music really being at the heart of that is a really personal one, and I think really broadly applicable. So through this journey, there are really four things that I've learned and four things I hope like you'll be convinced of um, by the end of, of this uh, talk. So the first is that music is a powerful universal form of uh, communication, right? It is a one of the earliest forms of healing that we have uh, for humans. It is gonna be critical to any struggle for freedom um, and it actually alters mood and cognition and we can show that. And so it should be an evidence-based part of like how we think of, uh, about practicing psychiatry. But then when I look back since like how have other people that I really respect and look up to have thought about this in the past, we come across this, uh, this quote by Franz Fernand and uh, Wretched of the Earth. And he says, we have noted the appearance of the movement in cultural forms. And we have seen that this movement and these new forms are linked to the state of maturity of the national consciousness. Now, Fanon is a genius and he says so many things with these words. And so there's a lot of meaning in there. But if you read Rest of the Earth and you read some of the ideas that he had about music, there are two main things that really stand out. The first is that music has a critical role in both encoding and driving the decolonization process. And we'll kind of get to that a little bit later. And the second thing is that as we actually go about that process of decolonization, we actually shift our mental model of music from merely a performance art to a critical tool for navigating trauma and violence and achieving and maintaining uh, community mental wellness. And so that was Fanon, you know, thinking about that in his time, but why should we care as psychiatrists today, right? So the first reason, psychiatry is in the midst of a worsening public health crisis. We are in a time right now where we actually need broadly applicable and cost-effective practices that we can deliver to groups of people. The one-to-one -one model isn't gonna be sustainable with the rising burden of mental health. So the argument is that like, well, music should actually be an intentional part of that solution. And I hope that at the end of this presentation, that's something that you also agree with. So when we look back in history at like, how has music been used in healing? We see the very, very earliest forms of healing. We're talking about the shaman, the griot, before medicine was sort of formalized in this sense, these people sort of were a mix of medicine man, musician, and spiritual leader. And so at the very beginning of human healing, we see this idea that these three threads kind of mix together. Um, and when, uh, you know, as, as medicine started to become sort of a little bit more formalized and really the first formal kind of practice of medicine we find in, in ancient Kemet, they actually use sound as a very major part of, 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 of healing. So they'd have sound rooms, for instance, that vibrate at specific frequencies and believe like this would actually have certain specific effects on mood and on, on areas of the body. The Greeks actually then picked up on this and Aristotle speaks about this. Pythagoras, who people, you know, you know of the Pythagorean theorem, everyone kind of has to learn that. He's a brilliant, you know, genius person. And one of the early things that he discovered and thought about was this idea that like, specific notes actually resonate at specific frequencies. 
And perhaps these very specific frequencies of vibration can have very specific effects. And he's one of the first people to really start getting at this idea that there's some kind of algorithmic thing to, uh, to, to music that could be used intentionally in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a healing context. So we see very early on music as being central to healing. So how did we get to this place today where music is kind of seen as maybe avant-garde or, or, or not really standard of care? So to look at this, we actually have to look directly at the colonization process. And so I wanna show this table, it's from this paper by Munyara Z. And I have a, a list of references kind of that people can feel free to look through, but it shows here some differences between African music and many of these, these sort of qualities are shared in, in the music of other native peoples. Um, and then Western music and Western music we can think of as music kind, kind of coming out of uh, the European tradition. And there are two main things I wanna kind of point your attention to. So the first is that in African music or native music, um, there's this communal sense. There's less of a separation between the audience and the performer. Music is just a part of life. It's not separated that. And that's sort of, uh, you know, that's sort of the antithesis of that in Western music is that there's really this distinction of like the arts, you know, the sciences, the, you know, the other parts of life and, and the audience and sort of the performer. And so that's, that's one key difference. The second is this idea that like music in Western music is really divorced from everyday aspects of life. It's sort of something that you interject at very specific times versus this idea that like life itself is musical and that just being an integral part. And so there's some evidence for like this sort of um, ideology actually creating this separation. So the first is like when we look at Puritan ideology, they kind of condemned music, art and dancing as illegit illegitimate recreational or leisure activities. So during the slave trade, as, as slaves came here, they weren't allowed to sort of practice music as integral to their culture in the way that they had. Uh, the only music that was regarded as effective uh, as a divine, uh, an effective divinely given tool was music that was helped to worship God. But again, this idea of God was very different than the, those who were coming here. And so there was already this kind of not only dissonance in terms of culture, but really now a, a spiritual dissonance. Um, and you can point to very specific things like the Slave Act of 1740, which bars slaves from using drums, horns, other loud instruments, and uh, communing at certain times. And I don't want to turn this necessarily into like a history lesson, but I do want to just highlight a few things that get at this idea that like actually colonization is what removed music from the cultural role that it once had for native people. Um, and so as people then began to think about decolonizing and pushing back against oppressive structures, we always see music again taking the central role in culture. Again, I won't make this a history lesson, but uh, when you look at the South African struggle for independence, Music plays a very central role to that. You have people like Miriam Makeba and Hugh Masekela who write songs specifically speaking of the kinds of oppression that they were experiencing and, and songs that were meant to also galvanize people and get them ready um, for, for you know, physical conflict. Um, you can also look at the Haitian Revolution um, where you know, on, the, on sort of the, the, one of the meetings that they had prior to deciding to start the revolution in earnest, you know, it's a communal gathering in the woods where they do this voodoo ceremony, which at the heart of that is music and dancing. And, and one uh, painter kind of illustrates that. But we can also then look directly at the experience of people of African descent sort of navigating through this country in which, you know, their, both their, their, their desire to not only deal with the oppression and music as sort of an emotional outlet for that, but then also kind of encoding what they were going through. Um, we see the original slave songs and Negro, Negro spirituals not only being used to sort of form these innovative ways of communicating, but really being these like communal kind of self-soothing mechanisms, right? The only times the slaves were able to get together um, and commune was during church. And so that you see them now taking a lot of their Africanisms uh, that were found in the music and then imbibing it into this space where they are allowed to commune and using that as, as, a, as a therapeutic space to deal with this extreme uh, uh, you know, trauma and violence uh, of slavery. And this idea of, of sort of the people of African sense experience being a way of, of expressing and birthing new music is something that we see continuing on. It comes later with blues. Um, and then uh, jazz, again, is, is another kind of huge moment of cultural revolution where music is kind of a, a central part of this idea of decolonization. And here I just have some of the people who are really at the forefront of this, right? Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, John Coltrane, um, uh, Miles Davis, Mary Lou Williams, uh, Herbie Hancock, I won't name all of them, but these are all people that are pushing against this idea of the, the black musician as being untalented, 
as not being able to play complicated music, only being able to play, you know, a, a three bar blues. And so they took this notion and they just blew it wide open as, as sort of a revolt to that. Prince says, you know, it's about being comfortable in an unfixed state while improvising the topography of your life and music as you go along. Beautifully said, but I want to actually point to this, this, this uh, next quote um, and, and, and highlight first uh, the role of many different women actually as a, part, um, as a part of this struggle as well and really giving voice to extreme emotion if you listen to something like Billie Holiday's um, Strange Fruit or um, Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn, um, you know, very much leading, uh, leading sort of that civil rights movement and the emotion and ethos uh, behind it. Um, so there's a quote here because there are people who have already thought about this and are much smarter than me and can say it much better. So I'm just going to leave this up here and give you guys a chance to be like a little active. So I'll give you a minute to read this quote because I think it really actually really synthesizes this idea as jazz um, for uh, this jazz, j this idea of jazz as cultural uh, decolonization. Yeah, and so, so we see jazz as, as a cultural decolonization, as, as an act of cultural decolonization. And then sort of that, that same ethos is then moved through to hip hop as it develops. And again, you see artists who at that time are speaking out against the kind of oppression that they face um, in the inner city and shedding light on things. And then also calling for this new sense of what it means to be black and really birthing a whole new culture that then over time becomes really the dominant culture of, of America. When people think of like what US culture is, a lot of that has been heavily influenced by what was created uh, through hip hop. Again, many people are thinking about these things and saying them much better than me. So I also wanna put up this quote for you all to read, which I think really sort of, um, again, synthesizes this idea of hip hop as cultural uh, decolonization. I just want to highlight that last part. They say, you know, peace, unity, love, and having fun as sort of the formulation of what hip hop is must be understood in the immediate context of its formulation as a rejection of the contemporary real reality of its antithesis, the reigning conditions of violence, disunity, hatred, and misery generated by internal colonialism. colonialism. And so, you know, that kind of sets the stage of, okay, so music has been kind of removed from a role that it once had through this process of colonization, how would we think about this as decolonization within psychiatry? So again, Fanon actually thought about this and we can kind of learn some things for his, from his example. So when he was the chief of service um, at Lido Joinville Psychiatric Hospital in Algeria, he actually made some really innovative changes. So he actually brought music therapy, art therapy, storytelling sessions, and these other modes of healing into the clinical context there. He actually took music lessons um, to better understand uh, music therapy. And he did things like take Arabic to better uh, understand how to communicate to his patients. So we see for not only understanding this idea of music and these other forms being really important to healing, but then actually instituting them within the academic framework. Um, but we can also kind of look at what we uh, kind of the kind of evidence that we've been uh, we've been able to collect now, even within sort of the Western framework. And so there's a lot of data. I don't want to go through all of it. I just want to kind of inundate you with the fact that like this has a mechanism, right? So music, you know, is one of the most powerful sources of auditory stimulation. It generates neural activity in many different re regions of the brain that are important for attention, memory, motor functions, semantic processing, and emotions. Um, when people are relaxing, you can see different changes on EEG. You can have release of endogenous opioid from the pituitary during listening to music. There are reduced levels of cortisol and ACTH in patients. And one of the uh, one of the studies I find always really interesting, they did a study in mice and actually showed that they were able to increase BDNF and NGF in rodents that were listening to music. So again, you know, we, th there's definitely mechanism for this operating at not just the level of, you know, aesthetics in the way that we understand it. 
Um, and so again, even when we look at actual practice of psychiatry, again, lots of things here, you can just kind of put them up. Um, but basically just showing you that like we've already accumulated evidence that music can be better at better than just the standard of care for people with depression, people with anxiety, people with schizophrenia and psychosis, um, uh, and, and, and individuals with Alzheimer's. And again, like I have references so that, you know, you can kind of look through all this data yourself if it's something you're uh, interested about. But one of the things I'm really interested in now is like, how do we accumulate more evidence for this, particularly in less contrived settings? And so one of the things that we're doing um, is the music mindfulness study in which we're asking like, how does a virtually community-based uh, music and mindfulness uh, intervention actually um, help people of African descent who are struggling with symptoms of, of anxiety and depression and can it enhance social connectedness? And so this is a collaboration between Yale Psychiatry Department one Village Healing, which is a community organization here in New Haven, which offers mindfulness classes. Um, Hip Hop Producers at In The Lab Productions, who are helping us with actually creating these mindfulness sessions. And then, you know, uh, as a disclosure, my company, Renaissance, which is helping with sort of marketing and outreach um, and community building as a part of, of a part of this study. And so a big part of, I think, decolonizing this in psychiatry is like actually accumulating the evidence for what things work and with what context, specifically in the outpatient context, in 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 in, uh, in ways in which people can sort of act natively and don't necessarily uh, have to come into the hospital, and so you know I hope with this sort of brief kind of lecture that we're able to just kind of get a sense for why I think music is really important in this context. But again, moving away from traditional ways in which academia are practiced, this is really much more about the experience. And so now we want to I want to ask my band to come up um, on bass. I have. My my bro from a long time, uh, Zwe, um, an amazing bassist, and I have I'm really blessed to have my son uh, Malachi, who's going to be playing uh, playing drums, and we're going to do four pieces. Uh, the first is going to be comment number one uh, by Gil Scott Heron. Um, again, this piece is a very raw piece. I'm just going to tell you up front. Uh, lots of expi uh, explicit language um, and very kind of harsh critiques of society. Um, the next piece that we're going to do is. Uh, by Donny Hathaway. It's called Someday We'll All Be Free. Um, for those of you who don't know, Donny Hathaway was a paranoid schizophrenic who actually committed suicide and one of the most brilliant voices, you know, of all time, uh, an amazing soul singer. And this, this song really speaks to me. Then I'm going to go on to do Bob Marley's redemption song. Most of you have probably heard this. Bob Marley is, you know, a legend and a prophet and this song means uh, a lot to me. And then the fourth song that I'm going to do is uh, the song Reach from uh, my project Black Pack, which I think helps to again, talk about even my own colonization, decolonization process and how like I view music and all of these things as, as a way, as a way of, of uh, gaining personal freedom and self-realization. Comment number one. The time is in the street, you know. Us living as we do upside down. And the new word to have is revolution. People don't even want to hear the preacher spill or spiel because God's whole card has been thoroughly peaked and America is now blood and tears instead of milk and honey. The youngsters who were programmed to continue fucking up woke up one night picking Paul Revere and Nat Turner as the good guys. America stripped for bed and we had not all yet closed our eyes. The signs of truth were tattooed across our open-ended vagina. We learned to our amazement untold tale of scandal. Two long centuries buried in the musty vault, holes down daily with a gagging perfume. America was a bastard. The illegitimate daughter of the mother country whose legs were then spread around the world and a rapist known as freedom, free doom. Democracy, liberty, and justice were revolutionary code names that preceded the bubbling, 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 bubbling in the mother country's crotch. And behold, a baby girl was born, nurtured by slaveholders and whitey racists. It grew and grew and grew, screwing indiscriminately like mother, like daughter, everything unplayed by her madam mother. The present mocks us, good black people with keen memories, set fire to the bastards who ask us in a whisper to melt and integrate. 
Young, very young, team bopping, revolt on weekend, young, dick by proxy, with a mental ass kicking they receive through institutionalized everything and bombing off slogans to stay out of Vietnam. They seek to hide their relationship with the world's prostitute, alienating themselves from everything except dirt and money. With long hair, grime, and dope to camel hide the things that cannot be hidden. They become runaway children to walk the streets downtown with everyday black people sitting on the curb crying because we know that they will go back home with a clear conscience and a college degree. The irony of it all is when a pale face as the motherfucker dares look hurt when I tell him go find his own revolution. He wonders why I tell him that America's revolution will not be the melting pot but the toilet bowl. He is fighting for legalized smoke Lower voting age, less lit from his generation gap, and fucking in the street. Where's my parallel to that? All I want is a good home, and a wife, and the children, and some food to feed them every night. That goes pale face to basics. Does little orphan Annie have a natural? Do Sluggo's kings make him a refugee from Mandango? What does Webster say about soul? I say, you silly child motherfucker, your great grandfather tied a ball and chain to my balls and bounced me through a cotton field while I lived in an unflushable toilet bowl, and now you want me to help you overthrow what? The only truth that can be delivered to a four year revolutionary with a whole card, i.e., skin, is this. Fuck up what you can in the name of Piggy Wallace, Nicholas Nixon, and Speedo Agnew. Leave Brother Cleveland and Brother Malcolm alone, please. After all is said and done, build a new route to China if they will have you. Who will survive in America? Who will survive in America? Who will survive in America?
see y'all and I can't hear y'all so I don't know if it's like coming out good. <laughs> well, hopefully y'all are enjoying it or at least vibing with it. Uh, we're going to do one more. This one we're going to do is Reach. Uh, again, this is uh, one of the singles from my project Black Pack. Um, hopefully it has some meaning. The devil tried to snatch me from my 
take a short break now we'll come back and hopefully have like a fruitful uh, fruitful discussion you can't hear the applause aza but i'm sure it's out there <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we taking off, it's like a rocket We be on the wave cause the music's supersonic And on them darker days the music was my only solace Now they vibing at my shows, loving that they love it Man, I hit up wave, yeah, that nigga like my brother These beats he cook like crap, I tell him send another And yeah, we can't go back, so my vision clearly forward yeah, I seen the future, love to tribe and death to cowards And really on this road, we gotta take it when it's ours So I sidestep off the traps, got my mind into some power For the war inside my head, for when life turns sweet to sour And now we in the live, niggas asking where we at Taking off, it's like a rocket We be on the wave, cause the music's supersonic And on them darker days, the music was my only solace Now they vibing at my shows Loving that they love it Take off, just like a rocket We be on the wave cause the music's supersonic And on them darker days the music was my only solace Now they vibing at my shows Loving that they love it <clears throat> I recall having no faith in myself No, I couldn't picture all this glow <clears throat> Now I'm just setting the place for myself and these niggas to see by the floor How to work out a way not to do it again and these buck on my coat as a snow So I'm putting in work they can pay my delivery Got a message for all of my enemies I'm a nigga that know my divinity Got a vision that came through this energy They said we would come up with this energy AZA in the booth is a scary me We get this one chance to be who we are Fuck what they talk about just reach for your stars Take off, it's like a rocket we be on the wave cause the music's supersonic And on them darker days the music was my only solace Now they vibing at my shows, loving that they love it Take off, 
It's like a rocket We be on the wave Cause the music's supersonic And on them darker days Music was my only solace I'm they vibing at my shows Loving that they love it Waves Just give us one more minute. Oh, there we go. Hope you guys enjoying this. In the meantime, feel free to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A function or fill out that feedback form. And just to add to that, uh, just to kind of make it easier, because uh, I think in the age of technology, there's always like so many choices. Uh, let's just try to put all the questions just in the Q&A portion. That'll be, it'll be really easy just for us to look at it and streamline it and kind of go from there. Um, yeah, anything you wanna add? No, take it away, yeah. doc. <laughs> All right, so hopefully everybody can hear us really, really well. Um, at this time, we wanna go ahead and transition and kind of the discuss in the Q and A. I already saw that there's one question in the Q and A and we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, you know, I think this has been an interesting night. There's a lot of things that we've talked about, uh, particularly AZ has talked about, because you know, this is his, uh, Kind of exploration um it's always great talking to you man you know i think we've known each other for like a year and a half now yeah, starting at the amex yeah. yeah uh so it's always a pleasure i always kind of enjoy our time together we have some really interesting discussions <laughs> definitely, um, definitely. yeah i think it's a, a kind of school enough itself just to kind of hang out with you and kick it with you so you know i think since i got the chance to know you i think i kind of have a sense of kind of who you are mm -hmm. uh and one thing that i'll always say is that you're a very very intentional person so kind of where I want to go with that is kind of starting at the uh, the songs that you chose tonight, particularly the first one, which was Gil Scott's Heron's piece, comment number one, which I think is a very raw piece, as you said. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's a very vulgar piece, mm -hmm. but I know because of who you are that you picked that piece for a reason. So would you mind just kind of starting off there, kind of like, kind of who was Gil Scott Heron? Like, why did you specifically chose this piece? Yeah. What was he really trying to say? And kind of how does this kind of like, uh, help kind of think about decolonization within mental health. So, I mean, Gil Scott Heron is another guy who is really revolutionary with his art. And most people might be familiar with him from uh, the poem, The Revolutionary Will Not Be, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. That's kind of one of his more popular um, poems. He all, has another one called Whitey on the Moon that talks mm -hmm. about the fact that so much money can be spent to send people to the moon, yet, they're pe yet his, his own sister, you know, uh, can't afford any medical treatment, right? Uh, so in this in this piece, comment number one, he is saying a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I don't necessarily share all of his views mm -hmm. in that, but I think this idea that like 
part of decolonization is really asking ourselves at the core, like what things are we willing to change mm -hmm. in order to create a different society? Mm -hmm. And him calling out this idea of people who like, you know, participate for the time being that is convenient and it makes them sort of feel good. But then when that time is done, they go back to upholding the very same systems mm -hmm. that um, are oppressive. Um, and I think he says that, you know, with some very, you know, colorful yeah, language yeah. and it's very raw. And I think the emotion of that time is really being channeled through his words and through his delivery. If you look at, at sort of his mm -hmm. own uh, performance, which I try to kind of channel, um, he really is, is speaking from a place of emotion mm -hmm. and, and of dealing with these things, you know, in a real way. And he's, he's someone who's always also, you know, suffered from um, um, heroin use mm -hmm. and like struggle with that for like, you know, his entire career kind of trying to, Trying to deal with his own, you know, his mm -hmm. own mental problems. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I think that, uh, you know, even though you know it's a, a raw piece, it's a very aggressive piece. You said it's a very vulgar piece. I think it's easy to kind of like forget the context, kind of to where that piece was kind of sitting within. And you know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm on, I'm only 28, so I wasn't around yeah, yeah, you know, at that yeah. point of time. But I can imagine seeing some of the harsh realities that he was seeing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and kind of like still having to deal with that as a person, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I, you know, this affects your mental health. It, this affects how you're feeling, you know, your ability to cope, you know, are you going to be able to survive with like this that is going on, right? So I think yeah. kind of really kind of like thinking about that. And I, and I think I'm saying that because I, I watched Roots the other day. And when I watched the Roots, I was like, whoa, whoa, this really happened. Like, I, yeah, yeah. And so I think yeah. once we kind of like contextualize kind of some of these things that was happening, it's easy to kind of then understand why something could be that aggressive. So, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you want to add? No, no, yeah, that was, that was Okay. Um, I want to move on because I, I really, really, I like Gil Scott Harris piece, but I, I really, really liked uh, the second piece, which was Donna Hathaway's. Yeah. Um, and I pulled this up just because I wanted to make sure I got the lyrics right. And he starts off by saying, hang on to the world as it spins around. Just don't let the spin get you down. Things are moving fast. Hold on tight and you will last. And I think anybody who has lived life, right? Specifically, this is yeah. what 2020 right now, yeah. Yeah. and things have been going crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know, I, I, you know, I talk to a lot of my friends and kind of keep up with them, and I know everybody's going through a lot. Um, and like, you know, I have friends who you know have gone to see psychiatrists or therapists because they're just trying to deal with what's going on. Yeah. And what I think is like really interesting about music, like when you hear a song like this, music has a way of like making you believe that this guy really meant what he was <laughs> saying you know what i mean and yeah, yeah. and sometimes i think when you see a therapist sometimes at first you just hear things but it's not hitting you in that way mm -hmm. when, you, when you hear a song like this i feel like you can't help but to want to hold on tight you know what i mean i do yeah uh, so do, you know yeah. what i mean i like the song but like why did you choose the song yeah. like why I mean, why are you trying to give this to the audience it's such it, it's so beautiful on, mm -hmm. on so many levels you know this song was written actually for donny hathaway by one of his friends mm -hmm. and you know they say that when he heard the final version of his performance, if you haven't heard this song, I really recommend uh, you you listen to it. It's, it's on Extensions of a Man, that project. He literally broke down and, and cried when he heard when he heard it, you know, to himself. And I really un I really understand that emotion as an artist. And I think, you know, Donny Hathaway was a paranoid schizophrenic again, like I said. And when you when you listen to the words in the context of that, and as as you know, as healers, as psychiatrists, thinking about like the kinds of experiences that you know our patients are having i think the thing that stands out to me about this is that even though you can conce conceptualize like what this would mean to someone who's mm -hmm. a paranoid schizophrenic one of his paranoias was that like white people were trying to you know steal his sound and like hook him up to machines to like extract his sound and use it to like financially destroy him and all these things there's some modicum of truth to that but the lyrics themselves are so universal, mm -hmm. right? Like they can speak to everyone. In fact, this song became kind of adopted as one of the songs mm -hmm. for the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't even initially written for that. So mm -hmm. it always speaks to me. And then the, just the structure quarterly, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like very beautiful chord movements that, you know, again, borrowing richly from that jazz tradition and that, that, that tradition and the way that it colors and the way that those progressions move carry a certain energy mm -hmm. um, that is really, really ancestral. So okay. I feel it. And since we kind of get into that, you've kind of played those keys. Uh, like one thing I've always noticed, you know, there's sometimes, and I think this is partly because I was in the band growing up. So something I just don't ever hear lyrics, all I hear is like the music. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, something about music that like when you hear it sometimes, even if you just don't understand, it could be in a different language, language right? Yeah. But it makes you feel something. And that only does it make you feel something, it can make you feel many different things, right? 
And so like one of my questions is like, you know, without getting too much into details, like why is that the case? Um, and if it is the case, like, do you feel like that's actually useful to use as like a, a therapeutic tool in psychiatry? Because I mean, you know, you know, I'm one of the first year interns, so I don't have as much clinical experience as you and, you know, a lot of the upper years who are above us. But, you know, I always hear that, you know, you want to relate to the patients, you want to connect to patients, you want to get them to open up, right? Yeah. And I, I feel like music has a way of kind of like automatically doing that if you could intentionally use it, you know what I mean? So I kind of wanted you to just kind of speak on that a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think it's, so one of the things I think we need is more understanding of like mm -hmm. the mechanism so mm -hmm. that we can really, especially me as a scientist, like I want to drill down into the algorithm and know like, if you play a two, five, one is going to do this in this key, mm -hmm. you know, you play a, you know, like that's how I want to understand it. We don't really have that detail level of an understanding, but there's certain general things, right? Like if I play a major chord, that is going to evoke a different kind of feeling than a minor, you know, a diminished, a half diminished or even a half diminished chord, right? If I, you know, they, so we know that like spacing notes out in different ways mm -hmm. can definitely evoke that kind of happier or mm -hmm. sadder feelings. Mm -hmm. But I think getting down into like the real algorithm mm -hmm. is one of the things like, I'm really interested in doing. Yeah. And we don't have as much information about that. But like I said, people like Pythagoras, the ancient, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Egyptians were already thinking about these things and had really good ideas about like how frequencies and resonance and, mm -hmm. and you know, harmonic, you know, series would all be able to like evoke certain mm -hmm. kinds of emotions. Yeah. Yeah. I got, and then kind of one other question and, you know, this is kind of like out there, but like, I know like, for example, you know, when you think of like psychodynamic psychotherapy and I don't know too much about all these therapies, mm -hmm. you know, every time I look, there's like a new therapy that's being created, mm -hmm. but you know, I know that, you know, at the end of the day, we have these types of therapies that kind of help people to like imagine different scenarios that they might be in, right? And then the therapist's job is to then help them to learn how to navigate that type of situation in the yeah. future. So kind of using like that metaphor, can you imagine a world, can you imagine a future where in psychiatry, because I know you love music, where maybe you, you could walk in or a therapist can walk in and either he plays a song, you play your keys, to elicit different emotions that then allow the patient to kind of learn how to navigate those different types of emotions or different types of traumas or whatever it's kind of bringing up. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, that's I, mean, kind of what I think a big part of my motivation and part of the reason why I feel so fortunate to be you know, you're here at Yale where like we have kind of the flexibility to, to try to study these things is like, I think that the future of psychiatry should look like, mm -hmm. music should be an intentional mm -hmm. part of what we do, right? Like, so someone's coming into your office, like there should be a certain kind of music playing, mm -hmm. like maybe, you know, you have music playing in the background mm -hmm. of your therapy session with no words, just certain kind of chord, chordal structures, certain kind of resonances. Mm -hmm. um, again, someone coming to someone who is a musician that can play very specific kinds of songs that help them kind of in, in an mm -hmm. acutely stressful time or mm -hmm. like these are all ways. And I think music therapy, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. has so many different ways in which it can be practiced and it actually is mm -hmm. uh, practiced that um, there's lots of ways and lots of spaces for people who aren't even musicians or, or musically um, sort of, you know, interested in that way to still be able to incorporate this um, as even as just an addition to standard mm -hmm. of care, right? You can still do all the same things, but look for those opportunities where music might be a, a great way to connect to a, a patient or set a certain kind of tone or environment, you know, uh, at, at your practice. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate it. So let's get to the next song. I'll just pull it up. Um, so I think I'm a little biased because all my family's from Jamaica. Yeah, so you're, I, you're a huge Bob fan. Yeah, right? I have like three pictures in my in my house. Uh, so, kind of like, what is he saying in this song? Kind of why did you choose this song? You know, kind of like connecting the dots for like the people in the audience. Kind of like as far as like the things that you're trying to convey to them. Like, yeah. like what is it about this song that you feel like is important? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is just Bob Marley, right? Like who he was and what he embodies as like a mystic and prophet of Rastafarianism and really using his music and his lifestyle to really push this idea ideology that like at the core of it is decolonization, mm -hmm. right? Like Rastafarian philosophy at the core um, is, is championing this idea of decolonization. And I mean, it shows up very clearly mm -hmm. in his words, right? Emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds, have no fear for atomic energy. None of them can stop time, you know? How long shall they kill mm -hmm. our pro So this song speaks to me a lot because again, like I, I grew up on Bob from a very mm -hmm. young age. And even before I really understood what was happening mm -hmm. in this music, it always resonated from, with me from a very, very young age. And this is one of those songs. And as I started to get older and realize sort of the power, mm -hmm. you know, we forward in this generation 
triumphantly. My hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty, right? Again, this nexus of spirituality mm -hmm. and, and music at the core of really, he's talking about revolutionary struggle for psychological mm -hmm. independence, mm -hmm. you know? And that is at the heart of decolonization is, is psychological freedom. And until that psychological freedom happens, the physical manifestation will continue to be what it is, you know? And, and then last, and I, and I have a bunch of questions, but I see some stuff in the Q&A too. So I wanna kind of balance those out. Um, and we can always get back to these songs and some of the stuff that you said yeah. earlier. Um, and the final song, Reach, um, it's kind of crazy because like I met you at AMET and I was with, uh, I remember my roommate, uh, me and my roommate Nick, we were hanging out. We met you and then we heard about the fact that you were doing these songs and we heard Reach and we're like, whoa, this is an interesting song. This album is really, really interesting. So kind of like, kind of lastly, like kind of how we've been doing, kind of like what made you pick this song? Yeah. You know, what do you want the audience to know about it? Kind of how does this relate to the general theme of the night? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Reach is a, is a really special song to me. It's like one of those songs that I think really comes from a, a like there's songs that you write where it's like there's a lot of you in it. Mm -hmm. And then there's songs that you write that are just straight spirit songs that just mm -hmm. come out, you mm -hmm. know, and this was kind of one of those songs. So I really feel it, you know, on a deep level. And it kind of just talks about, you know, my life and, mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, through everything, wherever we reach, we always have to be remembering community and like the people who have sold into us and and allowed us to blossom to where we are. And like everything we do must be in the greater context of like, how do we reach back for those people while mm -hmm. also still reaching mm -hmm. up past sort of societal limitations and part, and, you know, past all of the things that, you know, are, are, are seen as constraints while we reach up through those things mm -hmm. also still at the same time reaching back. And that is something that I always want to remind myself mm -hmm. of, because again, coming through these, um, these spaces, it can be easy to forget that. Yeah. And so, you know, this music always speaks back to me to remind mm -hmm. me to to continue to kind of live mm -hmm. that 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 path. You yeah. know? It almost seems essential to forget it sometimes, although it's really not essential. It's like, <laughs> uh, just kind of interesting, kind of what these spaces kind of can do to you as a as an individual. I have a bunch of other questions, and I kind of want to talk more about reach, but let's see what's in the Q and A. Um, so I'm just kind of gonna go down and, and yeah, really kind of like yeah, discuss. So it, yeah. uh, the first is actually from Flavia, who I could say is like one of our alumni in the psych program who also went to med school here at Yale. Yeah, and she, she's someone who really kind of put me onto Fanon at a deeper level yeah. and really made me go in and like think more about yeah. some of the things that he was saying. So did you mention by any chance, I know, I know we mentioned that Fanon was a medical doctor, but did, did you not mention he was a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. I don't think, yeah. but yeah. So from uh, Flavia, you know, this is really inspiring. I wonder if you have thought about body work, like the therapeutic role of dance or other movement with music. Absolutely. I mean, those things are so intimately linked, especially within the African diaspora, uh, diasporic experience, um, that you, you, you hardly don't see music without some kind of movement or dancing or communal, you know, movement. And so part of how I think, you know, and, and I've read this in, in other sources too, but part of what thinking about art as, uh, as cultural revolution and as a way of, of striving for freedom is that like slavery by definition seeks to confine, it's an embodied experience that seems that seeks to confine space mm -hmm. and seeks to confine um, movement and ability to, to, to uh, be free to communicate. And so music not only allows you to now communicate without necessarily using words, but dance is sort of the ultimate expression of a physical freedom and creativity. Mm -hmm. And so dance is a very powerful way of sort of embodying freedom and embodying um, revolutionary struggle. And I think, you know, dance is very intimately obviously linked uh, linked to music and, and that vibration. So there's definitely something I think about it, but y'all do not want to see me do that. So I still <laughs> I stuck to music tonight. <laughs> okay. Uh, next we have Ebony. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Ebony Brown. Uh, so what are the next steps I can take to implement actions to utilize music? And are there any models that I can utilize? Yeah, I mean, so I think part of it probably depends on like what level of training you're mm -hmm. at. So for instance, like I love Fanon's model, which was just like, okay, we're just gonna bring all of these useful sort of forms of healing into the space, right? So bring art therapy, music therapy, storytelling. And I know there, there, there are people implementing those things here. Like at CMHC, I've seen, you know, like, like storytelling groups and like some art therapy groups and things like that. Um, so I think those are, those are easy models. Again, I encourage like if there are ways to use music to connect with patients, 
Like I always find that really useful if like a certain kind of song comes up or just references to certain music from like a specific time can mm -hmm. automatically, you know, build a bridge. I think playing music again, if you have sort of some kind of instrumental music, and this is actually something I'm working on, kind of mood music for the therapeutic context, mm -hmm. where it's like something something you can play in the background at, at a low enough decibel where it doesn't interfere with the actual verbal communication, but still is setting a certain tone and a certain atmosphere that um, facilitates sort of that social connectedness and so uh, and communication. So those are kind of three ways, but I think part of this is that like, as we do better research mm -hmm. in actual clinical settings, we'll come up with better models of like, these are the best ways to like, you know, predictably use music to, to, to have a therapeutic uh, efficacy. Um, I'm gonna get to one of the other questions, but since you're kind of like talking about that now, I'm just curious because, you know, we talked tonight about music. Uh, we talked about it being the heart of decolonization and it playing a huge role in mental health and psychiatry. We saw that, you know, there's, there's people before us who uh, have tried to utilize this, but we see now that it's really not that utilized. Um, yeah. You know, I think growing up, if we hear about music, it's just like we were at, at home or in a party or, you know, or with our friends. But, you know, you really don't really learn about music in an intelligible way when you go to school. As psychiatry residents, it's not like, we go to class and they're saying like, oh, utilize music. Yeah. Uh, and like, as like a, a practice, like we don't have it in our practice. So kind of, I'm, I'm just curious, like, why is that the case? Do you think like the fact that we know that music can be helpful? I mean, obviously just like the medications that we have, we need to do more research in all these different things, yeah, right? Yeah. But like, why do you think it's so underutilized? Well, I mean, I think, so I don't have the data for this mm -hmm. specifically, but I think a part of it is this idea that like, the way that we practice psychiatry mm -hmm. is built around a Eurocentric model of what medicine um, and healing is. Mm -hmm. And kind of like one of the things I mentioned in the be beginning about this, this idea that like music being a re removed from certain mm -hmm. aspects of culture that it once was mm -hmm. actually central to like healing, like spirituality. I think that's a part of the fact that like psychiatry, mm -hmm. our field as we practiced was formulated with certain Eurocentric ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is a lot of what Fanon mm -hmm. talks about as well, you know? So I think, in my opinion, that's that's really mm -hmm. the reason, um, kind of like at the heart of that. Mm -hmm. And although, again, there, like I showed a slide with lots of data showing that like this works, it does things in the brain that we can measure. Um, the reason that it hasn't necessarily been adopted is because we still have this idea of like music as performance art and not something to be really mm -hmm. taking, you know, seriously as a very powerful uh, form of therapy. Okay. Appreciate that, Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have another question. Um, I think because it's, it's kind of a more sensitive question, it's, mm -hmm. uh, they did it anonymously. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, it says probably because I don't have a great background in hip hop and rap. Um, lots of hip hop I've heard speaks about and sometimes even glorifies violence against women. Yeah. Uh, speaking as a victim of sexual assault, assault, uh, excuse me, sexual assault, how do we both celebrate but also curate genres such as hip hop so that it's safe for those who consume it? Uh, um, kind of even think I, about yeah. you know, how to use this to better mental health. It's, yeah, I, I think that's such an important question. I'm glad that you bring that up. There's a book by Trisha Rose, I believe, called The Hip Hop Wars. And what it talks about is how hip hop in its initial formation, right, was this cultural revolution, as I, as I kind of alluded to in that, that statement that I, that I had us read alluded to. And what actually happened was that the music industry mm -hmm. and, again, the colonial power structure actually embedded itself into hip hop and then began to promote and put money and invest in um, the messaging that would actually be deleterious to our community. And so a lot of what you hear, right, I think is deliberately there, right? Whether it's, it's violence against women, whether it's violence against other people, whether it's drugs, whether it's all these aspects of culture that are real things that are happening, but somehow always seem to be the narratives that are, that are told and the narratives that are pushed forward. Um, and so, I mean, even for me, like an important part of me doing music is like always, you know, like in Reach, I said, I'll never sell my soul, but hope the music sells a bit. You know, people be vibing at my shows, power from the melanin. This idea that like, I know what kind of messaging I want to use this music for. And like, I'm not willing to make a lot of money to like betray that message. And I think that's a huge part of it. Um, and I think, I mean, if you want to go really deeply, then we have to talk about sort of, uh, you know, psychological residuals of slavery, how the black man and the black woman experience slavery and what that does to the way that we uh, navigate 
you know, our relationships with each other today, but to kind of constrain this and like not go too much into a tangent, I think my, my, my thought is that really a lot of that has to do with the, the, the media power structure and the kinds of messaging that they want to be promoted and they want to kind of circulate um, in the community. And the solution to that is like, we have to stop buying the shit, right? Like we have to start promoting the music that actually elevates our consciousness if we are spending money on that, then they'll have no choice but to invest in that. But if we continue to, you know, glorify that music and glorify that messaging, then that's what they will continue to invest in and promote. So I, hopefully that was, you know, that was a, um, a satisfying answer. But if not, I would really love to follow up with you and like talk about that in, in more detail. How can I reach you? Uh, AZA the Messenger on Instagram, aza.allsop at yale.edu for email. Um, and I, and I think if that doesn't work, I think the kind of the curators, the, the, the organizers, you can reach out to them and they probably connect you with AZA. Um, I think the next question is something that we already kind of hit on. I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, um, so overall, thanks for the presentation. So powerful. Uh, do you have any thoughts on African drumming as like, um, yeah, African drumming and his benefits on mental healing? Yeah, no, I think. Again, like if you were at the beginning of the presentation, right, we started off with this invocation and it started off with the music that was kind of this call and response and drumming. And we see that really the earliest forms of music are rhythmic, you know, before we could, you know, figure out all these cool things that we could do with different length strings and, you know, everything was sort of percussive. And so the original music is a very percussive music. And um, in, in, in traditional African music and other native music, polyrhythmic structure, that was one of the differences on that table, is really embedded there, right? So we, that rhythm and that vibration is definitely something, uh, something that's important. So African drumming, especially in a lot of these therapeutic contexts, not only, and, and there's some research behind this, although I don't know it that well, there's some, there's some level of synchronicity that occurs when people are engaged in, in music production together, right? So you have a bunch of people playing drums and they start to synchronize in this way that, that kind of creates this social cohesion that is very therapeutic. Um, and then sort of just the actual, the actual vibrations and the actual sort of physical movement is also, is also therapeutic. So the next question is actually a question that I, I was gonna ask something similar. So I'm gonna say this question. Um, so, uh, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce his name and I'm not gonna try because I feel like we live in a trying world and I don't wanna be on a, a meme for this. But um, it says your path as an artist scientist is very inspiring. Uh, I'm interested in knowing how slash if you are able to incorporate your musical talent into your work as a psychiatrist slash clinician, whether at a hospital or, or outpatient clinic. Uh, I think that's a really, really dope question. And um, maybe this is where you could kind of talk about, cause I know in the past we talked about maybe in the future having a, you know, kind of like within your clinical practice, the studio and why you think that could be benefit for the youth, beneficial for the youth and allowing them to kind of like navigate their emotions and mm -hmm. kind of utilize their creativity. Kind of like, like kind of like, what are your thoughts? What are the things that you're thinking about? Um, yeah. Yeah, so in, in the clinical context, this is something that like I'm still exploring. The way that I use it sort of just on day-to-day -day basis is that like, I always are, I'm trying to use music to connect to people. So whether or not it's talking about like current music, talking about like what kind of music do they like and figuring out why, cause you can actually learn a lot about someone and how they mm -hmm. kind of process emotions mm -hmm. and sort of content, like based on what kind of songs they like, mm -hmm. you know? So I use it always in that way. Like mm -hmm. I bring up songs a lot uh, in that way. Um, you know, I, I've personally been sort of using music as a way of helping people with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. That's something I kind of do outside of the, the traditional clinical context, doing mindfulness coaching and using music as a vehicle to like help with mm -hmm. mindfulness. In the future, you know, I really want to make music like an integral part of how I practice, how I provide therapy and really sort of creating an environment that's kind of like a studio environment like this, where, you know, a client can come in, we can kind of talk about what's going on, make some music together and, and, and just kind of really vibe. And, and, and a lot of times, actually, you find people going to a studio and it's for that reason, because it's, it's like a social, mm -hmm. a social scene where they can like make music and like kind of really feel the music powerfully with good speakers and stuff like that. So those are kind of things that I'm trying to work through. And again, I'm grateful to be in this residency mm -hmm. program because as a third year, we do have some 
flexibility in terms of how we you know structure outpatient one of the things that i'm working on is structuring an outpatient experience in which i can begin to try, kind of try out these ideas mm -hmm. and really build the evidence for this being something more broadly uh, adoptable did you explain to people kind of where you are right now because i think we're just kind of in this random room oh yeah, yeah. I mean, not, <laughs> yeah so i'm in my i'm in my i'm in my studio uh, renaissance studios you know here where like i do you know all, all my production and um you know making music and just vibe out meditate whatever mm -hmm. so yeah that's where we are right now i think that was an awesome question i'm gonna go ahead and try to pronounce the name i think it's aicha to say it's probably wrong i wish that you know you'd be able to tell it back to me but definitely reach out to me uh this is a really really dope question uh thanks so much um let's see who we have next okay so our next question is in 2017, um, I was accepted to a music therapy program uh, here in Philly. I noticed it was white slash colonialist in terms of what counts as music and therapy. My practice as a musician is about producing and DJing and community building and how all that can disrupt social impediments to mental health for uh, BIPOC communities. Uh, but this program was all about theory and genres like folk slash classical and the application of your descendant models of psychology. So in saying all this, you know, how do you build a space for your research in this type of climate? Um, yeah, that's a that's um, that's a really great question. Um, again, I think there's certain one of the things I've been learning, I think, is that there's certain things that are and aren't possible in academia, depending on where you are. Right. And I think understanding like what things can we achieve using the academic structure infrastructure and resources and what things do we need to do outside and on our own is a really important distinction so here for instance like we do have a lot of people who are mm -hmm. are really i mean we have something like website right which mm -hmm. is like really thinking about how do we push against sort of the traditional boundaries and conventionalism of our field and like make it better and there are a lot of people that care about that so that creates a space in which like I can do this kind of music, you know, do this kind of research in music and mindfulness and try to apply it to people back in the sense. But I think if you're operating in a community that is very married to a Eurocentric model and isn't willing to look at how there's value that can be had from varying perspectives, then you can't do it because mm -hmm. it, it's just not permissive. But I think exactly what you're talking mm -hmm. I mean, we should connect because exactly what you're talking about as a DJ and a producer, thinking about community building, those are exactly the kinds of ways in which I think music can be utilized, is utilized, you know, whether again, intentionally or unconsciously, right? When we look at hip hop, how it brought people together, you have a DJ and an MC. The DJ gives the beats, the MC kind of rallies the people and gets them kind of in the flow. And so that was community building, right? That was the core of that cultural revolution was bringing people together around music and dance and art, you know, visual art. So I think there's a lot of value and validity in what you're saying. And if you're in a department that um, doesn't see that, then either you need to be in a different department or you just need to understand that like, it's not going to be permissive there. You know, you get your degree and then you pursue what you actually want to pursue once you leave would be like how I would approach it. Um, I want to be mindful of time because I think it's supposed to go to 730 and 726. Okay. Um, I know there's a lot more questions. I don't know how you want to do this. Just, just go with what's kind of in order. Um, I do want to do like, just look at the references and do some acknowledgements. Okay. Um, so maybe we can do one more question. Okay. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, I'll actually, let me see them. Let me go from there. Which one? Let me just go in order. Yeah. Okay. So, the very next question is, what do you think are some of the biggest hurdles to music slash art based approaches being further embraced and integrated into existing models and systems? I think the only impediment at this point is enough of us trainees being willing to just say like we're gonna be conscious about doing this. Right, like I, I, I showed you, there's already evidence there that it works. People have tried it in the inpatient setting. People have tried it in various outpatient settings. So we, we already have evidence that like it does better than standard of care, right? If you keep the person on the same SSRI, you do everything the same, and then you just add music, they do better, and they do better in a multi-dimensional way. And that's for you know people with psychosis, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's, etc. Right. So there's a lot of data for that. I think we need more research, obviously, and that's, you know, I, I want to be a part of that. I'm, I'm being a part of that. Um, so I think that's one part of it, like doing research in a very intentional way of saying, like, let's create a model that could be broadly applicable and then test it. That hasn't been done as much, but I think that that's one part of it. Then the second part of it, I think, is really people who are psychiatry trainees now coming out of the of training saying, like, I'm going to be conscious about how I use this and be intentional about how I use this. If enough people start doing it, 
then it will be embraced, right? Like when when your clients actually like want to come to you because they have fun, because mm -hmm. music is fun, mm -hmm. right? And and you're making progress in a in a certain way, then people might look and be like, huh, like this person seems to have a very thriving practice. Mm -hmm. I wonder what they're doing. Oh, they incorporated music, right? I don't know, but I think those are the kinds of ways of thinking that could move this this sort of thing forward. So just because I'm being mindful of time, I feel really bad uh, for not getting to the rest of the questions. Maybe that's like the the older brother in me, like when I give one of my siblings <laughs> a gift and then the other one doesn't give a gift. I don't give a gift to them. They're like, ah, oh, they're like, ah. Oh. So, um, but hopefully uh, we can continue this discussion in some like format, uh, whether it's like through email or uh, it's gonna be hard to kind of get together in the time of COVID, but I think we can find some interesting ways. Uh, but yeah, so maybe we can just, I'll just go to, yeah. uh, I do right here. So reference. Hey, yeah. So those are some of the references. I'm happy if like anyone's interested, I'm happy to kind of just email those out to you so you can kind of just take a deeper look at, you know, I really browsed over a lot of things in the beginning, but those they're those that you know that stuff goes deep. So you know, feel free to look at that. And then also thank you to um just you know the department for and, and the NRTP for allowing me to like do this kind of research um in addition to the basic science stuff and for um uh, to the website, you know, committee for for seeing this as a valuable topic and and really giving me the space to do something that like I don't know many spaces that I would be able to do something like this in, and like it means a lot to me. I'm very passionate about this, um, and I hope that that came across, and I hope um, it was valuable to you know to everyone who uh, who attended. So, yeah, thank you guys so much. I'm not sure if the organizers have anything to say before the end of session before we end the session today. Uh, no, thank you so much. This was an incredible presentation. I uh, just wanted to add, if you have any feedback, uh, I'm going to drop that link in the form. Um, and maybe just two questions. I AZA and Durbin, if people have questions for you or are interested in hearing more of your music, how can folks do that? Because I know I'll look it up. <laughs> oh, you're on so, mute. Always unmute is very key uh, in this. Uh, this time of life on Zoom, uh, I'm ashamed now. Uh, but I think when it comes to music, you ask AZA. Like I play music, I play trumpet, I loved it. But I think AZA takes it to the next level. So if it comes to music, really ask him. But I think broadly speaking, like when it comes to like just you know other things with related to psychiatry, you could hit me and me or him up. Uh, our email addresses are super easy to find here at Yale. A lot of times you can literally just type in the first name dot last name, and like it will just like pop, pop up, up the way that. Uh, Outlook kind of like pre-generates or kind of like generates things. Uh, and and uh, if you follow me on Instagram um, at AZA, the messenger, um, you can kind of follow along with a lot of stuff I'm doing. And then if you just in any kind of any streaming platform, just type in AZA and then Black Pack, B-L-4-C-K-P-A-C-K. Um, you'll also find it YouTube as well. So. Yeah. I, I think AJ is really, really good about getting back. I'm not sure how he's like, always doing things but still able to be on instagram like, i don't know i feel like sometimes like he's showering he's on instagram you know he's eating he's on instagram you know what i mean so i feel like it's gonna be really really easy uh, to reach out to him or us um but anyway thank you guys so much uh for coming out tonight i think this has been really cool uh it's been trying just to kind of modify this in such a way that will be like kind of pleasing to the ears through the zoom, zoom platform uh but I, you know i think we got something done so thank you um i hope you guys have a great rest of the week a great rest of the year. Uh, hopefully, God will get us out of 2020 very soon. And uh, y'all take care. Thank you. Join, join us for the next and future Web Psych sessions.